and welcome to the second panel of the second day of our conference. Uh, it's really great to be here with you for the next hour and a half and the rest of the day. Um, my name is Lucy Wright. I'm an artist and a research fellow at the University of Leeds. I'm currently working on a project with Leila Jankovic over there uh, about failure in cultural participation projects and about how we might learn from those failures and help that to influence policy. Um, I'm really excited to be here uh, speaking or to chairing the panel today. Uh, the topic we have is democratic cultural policy and cultural participation. And we have four really excellent speakers who are going to share their views and experiences about the instrumentalization of arts and participation in cultural policy as it seeks to provide more opportunities for citizens' engagement in art. And they're going to also discuss some of the implications for cultural policy as an autonomous area. My own interest in instrumentalization comes from, I guess, a number of different sources, and uh, I, I feel as though it's a term that means very different things to different people, different stakeholders within the arts. So as a researcher, my, my take is perhaps somewhat different to my role as a, a, an arts programmer for an arts charity specializing in participatory and socially engaged art. Uh, and the same, again, as, as an artist, my, my take is somewhat different. So I'm really, I feel quite unresolved on this subject, and I'm looking forward to hearing what our speakers are going to share with us. So, as I say, we have four speakers. Each speaker has 15 minutes. I'm going to give a little wave when it gets to about 10 minutes. Uh, and I think we're going to have our questions at the end. So be thinking of anything that you want to ask our panelists. So the first uh, speaker that I'm going to introduce is Geir Vestheim. Uh, Geir is a professor emeritus at the University of Southeast Norway. His main research interests are cultural policies in the Nordic countries and internationally, for example, UNESCO and the Council of Europe, and the political functions of cultural institutions, for example, public libraries, museums, from a sociological and historical perspective. So I'm going to pass you over to Gear now. Thank you very much. I think I will start to thank Louis, Louis Bonnier for a good uh, lecture. And I think that what I'm going to say will fit well in with the frames that he described for us in his lecture. Uh, what I will do is that I will present uh, five statements. And to these statements, there are some uh, challenges which I think are very actual for cultural policy in our time. Um, and I can also say that my approach to cultural policy studies, I, I can say the, it's institutional. So my research has um, dealt very much about political institutions and also cultural institutions and their position in the society. So I think, uh, yes, I, and I make a um, an analytical distinction between participation in cultural life, uh, in cultural production as readers, uh, listeners, or as organizers of festivals, whatever, on one side, and participation in cultural policy making on the other. But I will be speaking about the latter. Uh, challenge number one is that participation in state-supported cultural policies and services in Western Europe after the Second World War has not changed very much, despite 70 years of active state cultural policy. And that's a problem. In the cultural policy programs um, um, of the first um, uh, years after the Second uh, World War was directed to all um, uh, citizens in, in, on the rhetorical uh, uh, level. And the strategy of many governments what, what was to spread, to distribute the classical bourgeois elite culture to the big uh, grand masses of, of the people. And this is uh, known as a democratization of culture. But the fact is that 
this strat strategy did not democratize the culture. The content of the culture did not uh, change. And uh, the politicians were not very occupied with the content of the culture. The culture, I mean, the culture with a capital C, it was taken for granted. And politicians expected that the workers with higher wages, more leisure time, uh, that they were, would be running for the cultural institutions because they took it for granted that they had a need for this classical culture. But the, op the politicians were too optimistic. Um, what happened was that the big, um, the broad masses of, of, of the public, uh, they went elsewhere. Europe, Western Europe was invaded by American industrial culture, American films, books, um, etc. That's where people, uh, that's where people went and they did not go to the theater, to the concert halls, to the opera, etc., etc. So, I mean, the, the big problem here was that the concept of culture and, and the content of culture was not paid attention to. A second challenge is that the field of culture and the arts is hierarchical. And that creates some problems. And all political systems be they authoritarian as well as democratic, open and liberal ones, they seem to foster hierarchies. In hierarchical processes, there are always social groups that want to be distinct in the meaning that Bourdieu put to that uh, concept. And they create ex excluding mechanisms that protect their own position. And I don't think that politicians in representative democ democracies can do much about it, even if they want. Because this is decided, I mean, that this is a structural problem and it's not specific for the cultural, um, cultural sector or uh, era. And politicians, they are often in the hands of experts because they are generalists and they are supposed to be generalists. So when they make decisions, these decisions very often, or you, you can say always, rest on input from specialists and experts. And these experts may be bureaucrats or professionals or maybe even academics. And uh, artist organizations and um, uh, organizations for pro professionals, they have, uh, they have a very strong position in, in the process of, create, of creating or making the cultural uh, policy as pressure groups. Challenge number three, the power relations between stakeholders in a decision-making process is asymmetric. Even in countries that consider themselves to be very democratic. And which are the consequences of this situation? Uh, and we can talk, we can, I, I, I will just comment on, on different uh, stakeholders or uh, stakeholders groups. Um, if I look back on the history of culture policy in Western Europe after the Second World War, we can, I, I think we can point to at least four groups. One group, uh, one group uh, is, are the politicians elected by popular vote. Another group are bureaucrats or civil ser servants working in public administration. A thir third group are professionals working in cultural institutions. And then we also have amateur activists, maybe um, on the regional and the local level, with idealistic interest in cultural issues. If we start with the politicians, um, they are elected by popular vote. So the source of their legitimacy rests with the voters. And 
In the end, they are responsible to the citizen, citizens who have voted them in. And in constitutional terms, the national assemblies have a prior position in culture policy, as well as in other policy areas. They make the formal decisions of culture policy. However, in practice, um, at least in parliamentarian systems, it is the government with its single ministries and with, uh, with its uh, arm, arm's length uh, uh, bodies, which initiate policy programs seeking support uh, from the majority of the National Assembly. And negotiations between politicians and other agents in the cultural field take place in what I call an overlapping zone where cultural and aesthetic rationality meet with political, economic and administrative rationality. And political, economic and managerial reason tend to prevail because it sets limits for what is possible for cultural policies in competition with other policy areas. Um, the second group and, uh, are the civil, civil servants. And the civil servants, they have a very strong position as premise deliverers uh, in political decision-making processes. And they are also responsible for implementing the policies when it has um, um, been deci deci decided for. And the th third group of stakeholders, the professional uh, working in institutions also have a, a, a strong positions and their legitimacy rests on their uh, special knowledge, professional knowledge through an higher ed education which has relevance very often for the, for the policy area. So they are the specialists and they have the real knowledge of the specific um, uh, cultural areas. The fourth group of agents are um, amateurs and they, were, they are participants on, 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 on a more, you could say, a more idealistic uh, uh, basis. And you could say that they are the voice of the people. Uh, in, pra in practice, I think that the people um, in, uh, belonging to this group in the local community, they are people with relatively high, uh, high status. And very often, um, business people come in here. So this is where the money come in and the discount and, and in, in the, in the, um, in, in the, on the local level, I think there is, there is much, uh, the business people, man people with money and economic interest, uh, they are getting a stronger and stronger position today. I also asked the question, is total autonomy and independence of culture and the arts possible and desirable in democratic culture policies? I think my question is no. Because when culture is made uh, subject to political action, it will inevitably be subject to political decisions and thereby be instrumentalized. Policy making is per definition an instrumental action in the sense that the democratic legitimacy of policy decisions rests with the rights and obligations of the citizen. In democratic political system, el elected politicians have a man mandate uh, from the citizens as voters. They do not act on their own. Hence, Culture policy making must, in constitutional terms, pay attention to the citizens. Decisions are not made for the sake itself. So in political terms and logics, culture policy or culture has no intrinsic value. It can only have value for someone in a democracy. And this someone 
that is the ordinary citizen. The ultimate objective of cultural policy, like in any, uh, any policy area, is to offer a social good or service to the single citizen as a member of society. Policy intentions go beyond the instrument itself, that is culture and the arts. But the, what policy, politicians want to obtain for the citizens and society may vary widely. It may be personal development for the citizens, well-being, aesthetic experience, and education, social justice, um, empowerment, democratic participation, economic development, social integration, etc., etc. So there is no such thing as a non-instrumental culture policy. It does not exist. We can only talk about different kinds of instrumental action and objectives. But within political reason, there are no non-instrumental objectives. And this, I will say, despite the fact that many politicians may say the opposite, I am tempted to say, Lord, forgive them, because I don't know, know what they say or do. Now, and I will finish with my the fifth challenge. Um, and now I'm moving a little bit over into political science. Political, science, political scientists argue that to make democracy uh, to function, a minimum of social and political trust is a necessary condition. The level of trust, in a, um, of social trust, in a country is a measure of whether individual citizens have general confidence each in each other. It should therefore say something about people's attitudes towards their co-citizens. A high level of social trust means that citizens normally consider each other to be reasonable, honorable, mutual, fair, united, and loyal to the laws, and respecting, uh, respecting uh, the laws and uh, the ethical uh, principles for good social uh, behavior. Whereas low social trust means that citizens normally consider each other with skepticism and that they are attentive and prepared for negative behavior when they meet someone they don't know. And a high level of political trust means that citizens consider political institutions and politicians to be legitimate, incorrupt, just, fair, reliable, and predictable. There is a low level of trust or political trust if the citizens consider political institutions and politicians to be the opposite. I think I will, I will just conclude there. And I will just say that one can argue that the le general level of social and political trust in a country will affect all policy areas and cultural policy, of course, included. Thank you. Okay, shall I start? Yes. So, um, good morning, and thank you so much, first of all, for the invitation to participate in this conference and to speak alongside such a phenomenal group of people. It is really great and an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to be a bit provocative, um, following actually my co-panelist, and I hope that is all right. My goal is to use this paper as a chance to share a question that has haunted me for some time. And that question is broadly, how can the cultural sector reject illiberal views on culture as worthy of being represented without basing that rejection on political statements? And I'll also share some initial thoughts as to how um, this question could be addressed. So I'm thinking out loud, and um, I hope you'll, you'll uh, forgive me. Um, and I'll be looking forward as well to your comments and feedbacks. feedback. So I'll be making three main points. Point one, sometimes the majority is illiberal, and cultural policymakers must recognize this possibility when designing policies focused on diversifying forms of cult participation and engagement. 
Point two, discussions of the relation between culture and democracy don't always acknowledge the complexity of democracy itself, and they should. And point three, if we recognize democracy as a complex, iterative process, and culture as an actor of democratic pluralization, this provides us with a justification to reject the claims of illiberal actors, one that is based not on political, but on normative grounds. And now I'll be connecting these three dots. But I want to start by mentioning one incident, and it occurred in 2018, and we see a small photo of this artwork there, when the city of Kassel in Germany dismantled the monument to strangers and refugees by Nigerian-born American artist Olu Ogibe. This was a 16-meter high obelisk that revealed in gold letters the inscription of the sentence, I was a stranger and you took me in. This verse from Matthew 25:35 appeared in German, English, Arabic, and Turkish. And after being the target of vandalism and far-right criticism, namely by a member of Alternative for Deutschland as, quote, ideologically polarizing, deformed art, unquote. And uh, after also the active lobbying by other local IFD politicians, the obelisk was removed. This and other similar incidents, which have gradually accumulated during the last few years in Europe, have made me think about whether one could possibly justify a, refu a refusal of the entry of illiberal actors and approaches into cultural policy and thinking without using political or strictly political arguments. Must this refusal be made on political grounds or can it be made outside of politics? Understood, of course, in a strict sense, everything is political, as you know, since uh, cultural studies. Um, and so, but I've come up with a tentative way to do this, which is composed of those three points. And so the first, as I said before, is that discussions around cultural democracy sometimes assume that if cultural democracy were to be enacted in practice, the cultural desires of the majority of citizens would be equally, if not more, progressive, inclusive, diverse, concerned with sustainable development, etc., than current cultural organizations, arts councils, funding agencies, arts ministries. In other words, cultural democracy, it is sometimes assumed, is a direct pathway for more diversity, recognition, and inclusivity. Because the majority of citizens, the assumption goes, is progressive. Um, now, although the incident that I mentioned was the result of activism by political actors, those were elected, not by a majority, but by a substantial number of citizens in any case. And so I, I would argue that these stories force us to ask some difficult questions, to be more direct. The radicalization of political discourse in the last few years in Europe forces us to re-examine the assumption that cultural democracy is necessarily a pathway for the intensification of liberal democratic cultural actions, programs, and policies. It is not. Sometimes, as the creators of the Arts Council feared, the majority can be illiberal. And cultural policymakers must continue to recognize this possibility when designing new policies and institutions, namely focus on diversifying forms of cultural participation and engagement. Why? Because those actors may then use those institutions. And so this is my first key point. And so and as, as I make this statement, I, one could accuse me, accuse me of being patronizing, right? Of non-expert audiences. And I just want to respond to this criticism as heads on. I am not suggesting that the cultural activities or preferences favored by most citizens are unworthy of support, not at all, but I'm also not assuming that the majority necessarily agrees with me, a supporter of liberal democracies. And I am taking that profound political disagreement seriously. That is, I would argue, the opposite of being patronizing. So, as I said, in my view, however, the assumption that all citizens are liberal is a mistake that is sometimes made in discussions of the relation between cultural and democracy, and especially when um, it takes the form of a simple opposition, right, between the top-down model, described as the democratization of culture framework, and this bottom-up approach, described as cultural uh, democracy. And this is a mistake that must be avoided, the simplification. Rather, when we examine the relation between culture and democracy, we must start by defining and recognizing both terms in their complexity including democracy. Um, 
so to be clear, I think the existence of multiple definitions of culture is something that is by definition central in these debates. But the complexity of democracy itself is not always acknowledged, and it should. This is my second key point. And so to help us keep such richness in mind, I suggest that we take into consideration an argument made by Clive Gray in an article for the International Journal of Cultural Policy, a 2012 um, article titled Democratic Cultural Policy, Democratic Forms and Policy Consequences. And briefly, Gray identifies a typology of four types of democracy. First, direct form of democracy, so illustrated by the idea of referenda to allow for direct individual choice on a given issue, the will of the people, the majority. A rep second, a representative form of democracy in which elected representatives make decisions on behalf of their electorate. Third, what he calls democratic elitism, elitism through stakeholders, exemplified by Gray by organizations that are structured according to the arm's length principle. And then finally, deliberative democracy through value clarification, to which he's, he's referring to the uses of techniques to identify um, policy choices. Uh, uh, so the, the, such value clarification methods might include citizen assemblies, for example, or polling, other forms of information gathering. So just before I advance, I just want to be clear as to why I'm talking about this again and to remind you of what has brought me to this discussion of democracy. As uh, Louis uh, discussed in his keynote, radical groups increasingly recognize the importance of cultural organizations and policies in the creation, circulation, and legitimation of broader narratives about what society looks like. That is, not only are exclusionary, nativist, ahistorical, if not completely fictional definitions of culture central in the political rhetoric of such actors, but they are also increasingly directing their activism at cultural work, organizations, and policies to change them as well. Now, one could interpret this, this, exist, this, this fact, this trend. Uh, one could interpret politicians and society's increasing political polarization as reinforcing the need to return to the model of the arms length, the autonomous arts organization model uh, that cannot be dictated, dictated upon by political actors, right? The arms length model with all that it would entail in terms of definitions of excellence, for example. But I want to suggest, however, that this is not necessarily the case and that an alternative emerges if we recognize the complexity of democracy itself. There is an alternative to returning to this democratic elitism of the arm's length uh, model, as Gray would call it, on the one hand. And there's also an alternative to suggesting that cultural funding and organizations should be chosen according to the will of the people. That is, to direct democracy on the other hand. So rather, I, I, I'd like to propose that we should define democracy as a process that combines multiple forms of citizen engagement in this view, democracy is simultaneously, again, to use Gray's categories, direct and representative and elitist through stakeholders and deliberative. And these methods combine into an iterative pluralist process that develops over time. So in other words, democracy isn't static. It's a continuously evolving process. We should talk about democratization rather than just democracy. Um, and this is evident, for example, in the gradual expansion of who is considered a citizen, right? Um, and the rights and responsibilities that are according to the citizen. So if we recognize this idea, the idea of democracy as a complex, iterative process that develops and intensifies over time, we should consider replacing or expanding, but I'd say replacing, the ideas of cultural democracy and democratization of culture with an approach that sees culture as an actor of broader processes of intensification of democratization. In other words, culture as an actor of pluralization. And so this is my third key point. And now you'll say, fine, that sounds okay, but what does this really mean? Like, what's the difference? So I think that if we understand culture as a policy field that contributes to a historical process of intensification and expansion of democratization, this necessarily questions the idea that it is culture's role to recognize and represent all existing voices, all groups, 
all positions and grievances. And it also allows us to avoid the language of emancipation, which, as important as it is, in my view, as a perspective, is extremely loaded. And it isn't always helpful if you want to speak to citizens with different political uh, backgrounds or views when justifying cultural action. So, and, and, this, and this is crucial. The rejection of these assumptions, the idea that, one must, that the cultural sector must represent all, or the idea of emancipation, isn't here being based on a political stance, but on a philosophical stance. And to be more specific, and I'm, I'll finish soon, in a multi-layered, process-based framework of culture as an actor in the expansion of democratization, cultural policy, organizations, and practices aren't constrained by a supposed equality or equivalence of all positions and grievances, which would otherwise mean that they would have the moral or political duty to represent the views of liberal actors. Rather, culture emerges as a space that is guided by the normative principle of expanding those who participate as equal. What philosopher Nancy Fraser describes as the principle of parity of participation. So what I'm asking is, how can cultural actors decide and argue, what is the argument that can be made if a cultural actor wants to argue that certain groups, that their grievances should not be recognized, they should not enter into debate. And Fraser um, writes in Redistribution and Recognition that the principle of parity of participation is unstatic. It depends on two conditions, objective and intersubjective. So a, um, the former, the objective understanding of parity of participation, uh, quote, precludes forms and levels of economic dependence that impede parity of participation, unquote. And then the second condition, the intersubjective condition, quote, precludes institutionalized norms that systematically depreciate some qualities of people and the qualities associated with them, unquote. Both are necessary, Fraser writes, for participatory parity. What this means in practice is, is that recognition claims, which I'm here interpreted, uh, interpreting in, in this case as a potential demand of an illiberal group for an artwork to be removed, these recognition claims for representation quote, must show they can also be taken seriously and included in the sector if, quote, they show that the socio-cultural institutional changes that they seek will supply the needed intersubjective conditions without unjustifiable creating or worsening other disparities, unquote. So the pr in practice, again, the principle of parity of participation states that actors that preclude, that limit, that interrupt the process of expanding redistribution or recognition, um, actors that limit this process, cut down this process of culture as democratization, as pluralization, are not to have their demands recognized. And so this principle of parity of participation provides an important test, a litmus test, to evaluate the balance between the desire for increased openness and for widening of, of, of forms of audience engagement on the one hand, and the idea that sometimes there must be some limits to that openness on the other hand. And so I conclude. And I conclude by returning to the monument to strangers and refugees. I was a stranger and you took me in. Replacing the goal of cultural democracy and democratization of culture with a focus on the contribution of culture to the expansion and the intensification of pluralist processes. Evaluating policies, programs, and practices aimed at supporting such processes according to the principle of parity of participation does recognize that there is an, un an inside and an outside. There's a stranger and a host. But this border isn't static. The door keeps moving, and before opening it, cultural policymakers and, act and actors must ask, who are you, stranger? What do you want? And recognize that on some occasions, they are right to keep that door closed. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. So our third speaker is Darko Babich. Uh, Darko holds a PhD in Museology and Heritage Studies. He's Chair of Museology at the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, University of Zagreb. 
Uh, he has ex significant experience in the implementation of EU-funded heritage and museum projects, as well as being an author and a regular advisor of numerous museum projects. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi to all, and of course I'm thankful to Cultura Nova for inviting me to share some of my ideas with you about a very broad and interesting topic we are discussing. I will, to be honest, from the beginning with you, I will focus just more for most to the museums, and uh, even within museums I will look for a, one a special case of uh, museums uh, from the past, just to try to illustrate some, some idea coming up, uh, out of my expertise. So I don't know how familiar you are with uh, ICOM, International Council of Museums, which is the, the World Museum Organization with 46,000 members all around the world. Exactly two months ago, the ICOM tried to propose to, to members as a part of General Assembly the new definition of museum, which compared to the old one, which is more or less focused on heritage of humanity, tangible, intangible, and research, conserver, exhibit, and so on, was quite a different. And I just point out uh, the first part, but you can see it on a slide. Museums are democratizing inclusive and polyphonic spaces for critical dialogue about the past and the futures acknowledging, addressing the conflicts and challenges of the present. They hold artifacts and specimens in trust for society, safeguarding the diverse memories for future generation and guarantee equal rights and equal access to heritage for all, all people. Let's leave the, the second part. You can, you can see it on the slide. So are you familiar with ICOM in general? Yeah, so do you know the results of the, 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 the voting? And then what's your opinion about it? Well, yeah, of, of course I need to explain. So uh, when the new definition was proposed, 71% uh, actually uh, uh, vote for postponing the, the discussion about definition. And uh, that means that 71% was more or less against. And even out of those 30, 29%, which was in favor of discussion, at least half was uh, in favor just to vote no. So that means more or less those people re uh, represented at the General Assembly, like 80% or plus was in favor to say no. So no matter of quite traditional definition we had in, in the past and quite advanced in a way uh, which was proposed as a part of the General Assembly, 80% of the people vote for no. Or if we, if we had the voting at the end, uh, the results will be 80% for no. So this, of course, could suggest that museums are very traditional. And in many discussion, when we are discussing about the culture in general, especially we are discussing about you know participating, inclusive, and so on, museums quite often, not in not maybe in all parts of the world, but quite often will be put on the side of very traditional institution. So. Do you think that museums are traditional? Uh, can I change my slide on my own? On? Okay. So I, I'm tending to do, <laughs> I'm tending to do a presentation to be participative, <laughs> so to say. So I'm asking questions. So do you think that museums are traditional in general? Okay, good. <laughs> there is some reaction. That, I, I certainly agree. So, not necessarily all museums are, you know, uh, traditional, or not necessarily all museums, better to say, are not, do have the problems with audience development and engagement. Uh, you can recognize this building, I'm sure about, yeah? That's Pedrera in Barcelona. And if I ask you about the most visited museum in city of Barcelona, you will say it is, which one? <laughs> you know that because you live there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. So this is the slide actually I'm using for to, to explain to my students about some other relation in between the reality of the world and museums. But yes, 
the most visited museum in Barcelona is Barca Museum. And the Barca Museum actually does not have problem with audience development. So there is at least 85,000 people around, you know, two times, well, at least one per week, more or less, uh, which are keen to visit museum too. So they came out of something, they came to a museum. And of course, this is not just, you know, something we need to follow, but just to have or give you the different perspective. And what about uh, the, the audience? What about, uh, what about the, the, the people in general, which are audience? So again, you can recognize both, both images, the Egypt and the Las Vegas, and there is some numbers nearby. So 35 million in general, five million, six million, sorry. And it was number before the Arab uh, uh, Spring. And can you tell me what is wrong? It's the number, the numbers suggest the number of visitors. So what is wrong? Of course, that's it. So even before the, 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 the crisis, you know, more or less six million people visit the, 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 the uh, Egypt well. In, in doing different kind of the tours there and the 35 million people visit Las Vegas. One of explanation which was interesting to me, and it's saying more about US society maybe than all around the world, is that people have explanation that it's not worth to travel to Egypt, Athens, Rome, and so other places when you can visit all of them in one city. In Las Vegas, exactly, and that's perception of part of the audience we are discussing about. And I'm, I'm not saying nothing bad about those, those audience, just saying we need to be aware of that. So what I would like to discuss partly, and what is part of my perspective is that in all these relations and so on, all, all this discussion we have, that I think that part of responsibility and very important part of responsibility is actually on us. And when I'm saying on us, I could say on us as professionals, for example, in museums like curators, for me as a university professor, as professor, for us as uh, people here discussing about and so on and so on. And looking from the perspective of museums, which is of course connected with the heritage or in general speaking about the heritage, 10 years plus, we start to discuss, seriously start to discuss about something which is called critical heritage studies. In sense of really critically looking at what heritage is, what is not, how it's constructed and so on and so on. And many people dislike this, many people still dislike this kind of discussion. And I will tell you that's because we are you know, losing our privileges as professionals. But anyhow, that approach is something, seems to me, which open up quite serious, more space to be more inclusive, to, more, to be more participatory, and so on and so on, as far as we are discussing at least things connected with the heritage, including museums. One of, uh, defin well, not definition, just the, the, the sentence uh, which do, explain the critical approach in, in, in a way is this one from, from Laura Jen Smith, Australian uh, 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 researcher, saying what makes things valuable and meaningful, what makes them heritage, or what makes make the collection of rocks in a field Stonehenge are the present day culture processes and activities that they are undertaken and around them and which they become a part. So more or less, as you know, and this is not maybe necessarily new, but it's, as I said, partly new as serious discussion is going on 10 years plus, is that heritage is that part of the past which we selected in the present for contemporary purposes only, no matter of the reason why, and the heritage is heritage because it is subject to the management and preservation, conservation processes, not because it simply is, not because it exists, but just because we selected it with this or that reason for contemporary reasons. In fact, that interpretation at the end, as we know, is all. But this all, the statement here and many others, of course, do point to us, as I said, to us as a professional to differently start to look 
at our position and our role. Having, say, having said all that, I would like to just give you a brief uh, look at a, some uh, mm -hmm, and some theoretical experiment, and not only theoretical, theoretical and practical experiment from a museum field in the past. So, out of 1968 revolt, which was, as all of you know, about elitist and so on and so on, at the beginning of 70s, some of museum workers decided to try to do things differently. In that sense, three French museologists actually start something which call, they called later on eco-museum model. And eco-museum model in one slide is that museum is not about collection anymore. Museum is about totality of the heritage. That museum is not about a building. That museum is about the entire territory where that heritage of all people exists. And finally, that museum is not discussing about the public or even audience or even users, that eco-museum discussing only about community. One of definition that done by the, the one of the uh, experts involved in creating of eco-museums was that any movable or unmovable object within the community's premier perimeter is psychological part of the museum, introducing in that way not the, the property right, but the cultural property right, which does not have any connection with the legal rights of owning any objects on, or heritage. And this, of course, from today's perspective, it's not necessarily so interesting, but these eco-museums with this kind of idea actually started in 1971. And as a model, as something which started to be present in France and then later on in Quebec, firstly, then Scandinavia, then Mexico and parts, parts of South America, and later on all around the world, is something which anticipated part of discussion we are having now as well as some other parts like sustainable development and tangible heritage and so on and so on, which we are discussing in some other fields too. In brief, trying to explain how that works, there is a slide, which I cannot see from here anymore, so. <laughs> Can I go there? Do you recording from here? Or you just recording from here? Yeah, that will be perfect. So. There is a model done by French, uh, uh, Canadian museologists as a three-year model, so to say, uh, uh, in which the community actually started the process and of recognizing uh, what is the, thank you, of recognizing what is the, the issue they want to address. And then there is a, starting with provocation, meets, identifying problems and so on, so raising awareness. Then there is a second moment, it's not necessary three years in this, you know, just regular three years, but this is a process. Then the second part, going with, you know, uh, mobilization, uh, creation of, uh, in this sense, eco-museums, of course, and so on, with a syner synergy and er energy coming off, out of community. And the last part, of course, is evaluation, uh, negotiation, partnership, review, and future actions, which you know, close the circle of two, three years in which community actually starting from recognizing what they want and what they need creates the institution or model or tool which do react on what community actually wants, make some reaction, and then out of feedback there is a correction if needed or continues that way. Eco-museums, in that sense, again, started in the 1970s, beginning of 70s, could be or could exist any place. Uh, could be in, you know, the rural part, could be in urban part, could be in ex-industrial uh, area, suburb of some city, or any other part of the world. In this case, it's just favela in Rio de Janeiro, of course, again, addressing some of the issue they have there. So, as I said, Part of my point or main idea, which I would like to put on a table, so to say, 
is that we, and I'm saying here, of course, from my point, heritage experts for and most, must act as mediators, exactly like they, in a way, acted in the establishment of eco-museums. So we are mediators which are in process of bringing source and users, which are not right terms here, but actually we are assisting commu community to detect the problem, to address that problem, to create, in, a, in my case, museum or institution, which will help community at the end to reach some goals and to benefit that community without involving too much ourselves except to acting actually as a catalyst. And that's what I wanted to, to point out. Uh, I, I know it's just, you know, shrink it to museums, but just uh, 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 remember that idea of responsibility of us as professionals. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're on to our final speaker of the panel. Uh, that would be Bjarki Baltiasen, who's Associate Professor at the Department of Arts and Cultural Studies, University of Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, his current research is focused on cultural participation, digital cultural politics, and algorithmic platform societies. I'll pass you over. Thank you, Lucy. And uh, I want to follow the good example and uh, say many thanks to the organizers for the invitation, of course. Um, it's been interesting and fun so far. Um, and um, my talk will actually feed quite well into the uh, panel because I would kind of been talking about cultural policy, museums, and democracy in some way or the other. Um, but, but my focus will primarily be on participation as premise, as I call it. And uh, I've taken this quite seriously in terms of the description of the panel and, and kind of trying to engage with uh, 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 how, how it was described. Um, and while certainly acknowledging the panel's aim of discussing and perhaps balancing between elitist and populist approaches to cultural policy, I still claim that participation is still a necessary premise for both approaches. Um, I would therefore like to challenge the notion of elitist participation and populist participation. Um, and further relate this to the field of cultural policy. I will also kind of uh, uh, relate directly to the, uh, the heading of the, uh, of the uh, uh, panel, which is on democratic cultural policy and cultural participation. So first, democratic cultural policy. Uh, I don't think that cultural policy is particularly democratic, um, or at least that it depends on how we perceive the democratic and democracy. Um, and there are many definitions, and we heard some of them here, and, and, uh, and I was going to settle with kind of uh, the two heavily cited ones, the deliberate one and the radical one, but it's really nice that we have more definitions on the table right now. Um, but if I would have to choose in the context of cultural policy between the deliberative or radical, I would in this case go with the radical one. And I do that because it inserts power in some sort of hierarchies at its core. Um, so cultural politics and cultural policy is a power game which facilitates certain views, modes of thoughts and values at the account of others. And this is of course democratic in the sense of the conflictual version of democracy. And here the interesting question becomes who, as in prominent gatekeepers, and what, as in prominent institutions, get to include and exclude. It was Jordan in Wieden in 1995 that wrote a, a, a really nice book on cultural politics. Uh, and they claim that it's all about power. Uh, the power to name, the power to represent common sense, the power to create official versions, the power to represent the legitimate social world. They, ask, they also ask crucial questions on whose culture shall be the official and whose shall be subordinated. What culture shall be regarded as worthy of display and which shall be hidden? Whose history shall be remembered and whose forgotten? Who is representing whom and on what basis? So if we project some of these vision to an established cultural institutions like the museum, so here is the link, um, we can actually ask similar questions. Can a museum be democratic? So within relatively recent studies on new museology, there are many that advocate for this view. And according to this, museums should take a step away from being sites of awe 
and towards discourses in critical reflection that share sensitivity to all parties, to be transparent in its decision making and to actively share power. But is it necessarily uh, democratic to share power? And what does that even mean to share power? Isn't it just constructing new hierarchies? But surely it must be good to kind of embrace many viewpoints instead of few. And I certainly ascribe to that. But what does, but that does not necessarily make it more democratic. Providing access channels for more voices and some sort of cultural participation does not ensure democratic forms of cultural policy. So as you can hear, I'm not totally sold about this democratic cultural policy. It is conflictual and this should be embraced as being just that. That does not make it not democratic, but it just needs that, you know, uh, that we think about dem democracy in certain ways. That's my point. So perhaps the, the notion of conflictual cultural policy uh, could be something to work with. And this is very much taken to the Mufian notion of, of uh, conflictual consensus as a certain response to the Habermasian deliberative model. So conflictual cultural policy would then be somehow aware of itself as a power game. And if the access and rules are clear and transparent, the consequences of losing and winning are explicitly termed, this might be something to work with. But democratic, let's save that for the discussion. Concerning the latter, cultural participation, the following is stated in the description of this seminar, and this is what I, what I took kind of the, 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 the pre-ordered job that we were meant to take seriously, very seriously. So I quote, and this is from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, from the program. In the field of culture, the issue of cultural participation emphasizes the tension between elitist and popular approach to arts and culture, where the former understands arts as an exceptional area with its own logic, aesthetic values, and principles, while the latter sees culture as ordinary and part of everyday life, unquote. And while I certainly think the notions of elitist and popular approach to arts and culture are somehow justifiable as terms, particularly when explained in appropriate context, there is still something about predominantly the elitist version as, as explained here that triggers me. In particular, the part on the own logics, the aesthetic values uh, and principles. And here, as many others have done here, I'm, I'm, I'm too much of a Bourdieuian, if that's a word, to accept the principle. Um, in the field of cultural production, Bourdieu talks about the axis of autonomy and, and, and heteronomy and how objects and artifacts can be placed on this axis, which never can be fully autonomous, but perhaps semi-autonomous at its best. Importantly, this axis is dynamic in the sense that artworks can be ascribed different values in different stages over time. And indeed, in the essay, Bourdieu says, and there's another quote coming, the work of art is an object which exists as such only by virtue of the collective belief which knows and acknowledges it as a work of art. Unquote. So it's the collective belief uh, that becomes interesting. Again, who is the prominent gatekeeper? And what are the prominent institutions? Who are the main actors in shaping this collective belief? In a Bourdieuian view, there will be education, there is school, there is family, different form of capitals, etc., habitus, but there are certainly all, as well the professionals and the professional institutions. The people that have invested in long educations to become experts, to invest time and toil to become really good at what they're doing. And this basically constitutes the gap between professionals and amateurs. And these, in our case, are museum experts, gallerists, critiques, cultural journalists, art historians, etc., etc. But while these are professional occupations, there are also institutions in which these professional occupations, in one way or the other, find outlets for their expertise. Museums are quite powerful in this context. I've been my prior research with museology referred to them as charged spaces, charged, charged spaces. Um, the notion refers to the museum's historical, cultural, and political significance as an institution that produces, maintains, and represents our common identity, history, and heritage. And furthermore, it inserts certain charts to the space, the objects, the actors, and non-actors that it encapsulates. This is what makes it powerful. And this is where the idea of democratic institution becomes challenging. Janet Marston uses four metaphors to describe the museum. The shrine, the market-driven uh, industry, colonizing space, and post-museum. 
I'm not going to discuss these seeds separately. There's no time for, while, for that. But in a way, they are quite transparent as terms. Uh, but interestingly, the, the first three belong to the old museology. And it's only the last one, the post-museum, that clearly belongs to the new museology, as it is a reaction towards the other three. It's this one that emphasizes cultural participation understood as tilting the power balance away from the shrine, the cultural industries, and the colonizing space towards the space of many voices, of transparent power structures, of co-creation in terms of curational work and administrative work. And this is, in a way, all good, but I still I would still be a bit careful and advocate for context awareness and context sensitivity, and perhaps as well, historical consciousness. Participation has always been a premise for cultural policy. It's not something recent. Uh, we can categorize, categorize these in terms of dominant discourses during specific periods, which differ from context to context and country to country. And we had some of these in, in, uh, in Lewis's uh, uh, talk from cultural democracy to democratization of culture to economic instrumentalization, experience economy, if we'd like, and perhaps cultural democracy 2.0. This is perhaps where we are at the moment with all the user generated content, the co-creation, etc. These are useful to further explain dominant discourses in specific contexts. What they have, have, have in common is the premise of participation. None of them is against participation. They're all dependent on participation. And so are state settings within what is this panel refers to as the high and the popular. No curators design exhibitions not meant for participation. The same goes with initiatives that have stage settings in different places than that of the museum, like festivals, cultural houses, community houses, public spaces, etc. Very rarely, spaces are designed, curated, or molded for non-participation in mind. And here, the notion of participation could become interesting again. So imagine a classical museum representation understood as this rhyme. And that would be kind of post 55 year old lady staring at a painting. And that's a caricature, of course. But she's not just staring. She might be getting absorbed in a painting that moves something extremely strong with her, making her feel, experience, think, reflect, and perhaps experience what Roland Barthes referred to as the Chusans. And uh, Nico had it in his uh, presentation as well yesterday, which in English has been uh, termed the bliss. According to Barthes, the Jusan's bliss is not explainable. It is powerful, it's a powerful affective feeling. It imposes a state of loss. It discomforts, unsettles historical, cultural, psychological assumption, the consistency of taste, values, and memories. I've experienced this in a traditional museum setting of the shrine, when confronted with what I bodily and mindfully decoded as great art. And I'm assuming that the post 55 year old lady could potentially be experiencing something similar. But yet this is silent, motionless, non-visual, quiet, non-measurable form for perception turning into participation potentially. And how? It's here that uh, Ron Bart becomes interesting again. Because he, always, he, always, uh, he, he, he operates as well with, uh, with the concept of pleasure. And the pleasure is associated with the text that comes from culture and does not break with it. It is linked to a comfortable practice of reading. It's pleasurable. But these are not opposites. Because two sense can, in the reflecting phase, lead to pleasure. My point here is that uh, some artists potentially can evoke as perception, can then transform to pleasure, which then can transform to some kind of active participation as we know it in some of the literature of, of participation. I'm going to take one example. It's a digital example of uh, the Rijksmuseum in, in uh, Amsterdam. They're quite uh, uh, occupied by digital communication. So they made a, a project called the Rijks Studio. And it's a digital interface that encourages users to participate in a particular stage setting. The museum has digitized a collection of its masterpieces they refer it to as masterpieces, that's important. It's not my, me doing that. And users can crop parts of the digitized paintings and project these to other contexts. By, for instance, making t-shirts, mugs, iPhone covers. They, name, they mention cars, you can decorate your car, etc. 
So this participatory design cuts across Martin's metaphors as the objects gain value, not as marks and iPhone covers, but as marks and iPhone covers that have gained an extra charge of celebrated masterpieces. So, elitist or not, popular or not, participation is a premise. There are good and bad settings for facilitating cultural participation, but this has less to do with the elitist and popular, but rather to give to the given context of participatory design. So I plead for context awareness and an analysis in deciphering given contexts, and importantly, to be aware of the underlying power game that ultimately is taking place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I mean, we have a few minutes for questions. I don't want to keep people away from their lunches for too long, so uh, I'm gonna pass straight over to the floor. If anybody has any questions for any or all of our panelists, please speak now. Well then, I will take my prerogative as the chair of the session. So as the uh, kind of resident artist, uh, uh, on the panel today, I kind of would like to return, if we can, to the uh, the title of the panel today, the, the balancing act between the autonomy of the arts and the artist, I guess, and cultural participation. I know that um, as an artist and when I work with other artists, the issue of the instrumentalization or the potential instrumentalization of their practice is something that is often quite heavily resisted, you know, representing a sense of loss of freedom. So with the, the opening up of cultural democracy, something is felt to be lost by artists. And I feel we hear a lot about that, you know, within the field that I work at least, I hear a lot of the voices of artists. I hear less, I guess, about how instrumentalization uh, affects or implicates the communities uh, that, that, that are being engaged. So, you know, for example, uh, by engaging with communities, uh, it, it's also about the continued public expenditure of the arts, about justifying that continued expenditure. Um, this is a very long comment, I apologize. My, my background's in the folk arts, which is a very kind of participatory space by nature. Um, and one thing that interests me is that the people that I would work with uh, in that area, who wouldn't necessarily identify as artists, um, but they do automatically embrace the instrumentalization of their practice. They don't separate out that form and function. For them, it's always about the use of this practice. So I wonder to some extent, is that, that instrumentalization a somewhat elite uh, you know, viewpoint to begin with? So very long way of saying, my, my question would be, um, to what extent is it the role and responsibility of cultural, part of cultural policy makers to protect the autonomy of artists and arts workers? Any thoughts on that? Um, um, since I said in my presentation that um, I think I answered no on the questions of the total independence of, uh, of artists and cultural workers. What I mean is, of course, I take it for granted then that we must have, we need to have a society that respects the classical liberal rights, of, um, the freedom of expression and so on. So of course I don't mean that politicians should intervene directly into, for instance, the creative work, um, artistic work, uh, because we mu this must be organized uh, with independent bodies, maybe specialists uh, are there, but that's one thing. But um, if you see it from the political system, uh, uh, inside the political system, and the rationality and uh, also the legitimacy of the political system that is not for instance um, it is not democratically i mean uh, fair to argue that we will support certain group of artists for themselves or for uh, the intrinsic value of what they create the only legitimate argument in the end must be that this is for the citizens and this is 
a political it's a political argument and so and that's uh, that's why it's so strange to hear politicians say we will support the arts for the its intrinsic value i mean it's not logical yeah thanks well i, I of course i agree and uh, the, that means probably you're not happy with that kind of answer <laughs> uh, but uh, maybe just one parallel in the sense of uh, you know you suppose the arts is supposed to find a way to to really uh, reach the the community and that's the best way and uh, you know politicians after all uh, do have the mandate of four years usually and they're looking for a next one and the next one is coming from community by votes so if you know if community is sending the signal we want the next the the stadium the new stadium probably politicians will go for that no matter what because after all they are looking for another mandate uh not so ethical uh so i think the the, the way is just to I, I don't have solution how to do it but the way is just to reach the the the, the, the community to create that connection with the community uh, not only community, of course, experts and so on, but over all that uh, medium uh, uh, to, to, reach, uh, to reach people. That people actually at the end would say, uh, we want that. Like, just one example, you, you may, m many of you m m know that better than, than me, but like 20 years ago, the museum UK Museum Association uh, done the campaign that more, museums are visit that more people are visiting museums than the, the football matches. And the football is a big deal in UK, and that was that was brilliant message and brilliant the promotional campaign for museums, because the, statistically that's true. So in that that maybe not doing that kind of campaign, but just reaching the the, the people who are actually do have the, the the power to make kind of the pressure on polit politicians. Thank you. Anyone else have anything? Uh, right, so I share some points, disagree with others. Um, so I agree as well with the idea that the, it's just important to stress again that um, the autonomy of artists by itself, um, I don't really think that it exists. So I would say again provocatively that rather than talking about protecting the autonomy of artists, the artists um, cultural policymakers should give artists the possibility to choose what they want to be complicit the most with, <laughs> right? So, what? Do, uh, because autonomy is always a um, always comes with certain trade-offs. So, I'd say cultural artists should be able to make those choices, and cultural policymakers should ensure uh, as much as possible that the field. Um, of possibilities of what's an artist, what's a valid, what's a relevant art practice or artistic practice is really widened so that artists can choose their different trade-offs, their different uh, forms of complicity, right, in different contexts. And in more seriously, less provocatively, this for me is really why a feminist approach to power is so important, right? If you diversify, um, if you diversify uh, power. So if you allow for different understandings, again, of what is relevant to be part of the field, then that allows some individuals more power to make their own choices as what they want their work to be. I don't know if that was coherent, but that's yeah. my answer. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Um, well, if we play with the thought that there is something called autonomy, yeah. which I <laughs> yeah, I agree that perhaps we're a bit skeptical in terms of, um, I think, don't think cultural policy is at all strong enough as a device to ensure <laughs> that, or, or that many things for that matter, actually. Um, so I would, I would plead for a, a, a kind of a more fine-grained uh, analysis of the whole field of cultural production, where cultural policy definitely is one amongst many uh, factors that move the field and move the power tensions within the field. Um, and I think we should do this in appropriate contexts. And I think that uh, Lewis's uh, uh, presentation showed that, that these contexts differ 
Um, so the cult of uh, the, the field of cultural production is very, very different, and, and the actors as well, and the ideologies that move it. Um, what I think as well is that uh, at, at, uh, a step in the right direction is always transparency, because transparency uh, feeds into democratic processes. I think they're conflictual, but it's easy, easier to have the right to disagree when things are transparent. Um, and I think it should be a pact with the uh, kind of a, a deal that you make with society that this is important, that you know, we have this concept of autonomy, we might disagree or, 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 or not, but, but there is something about, it's like me as a researcher, you know, I don't like when a university, a university scholar, you know, I don't like if there's a po politician coming and telling me what to write, you know. So, so, so it's the same with artists, you know, so it's a different system, it's a different system, but if we want to kind of make our democracy the way that we sometimes think about it in these terms, we need to have these breathing spaces of, of, of free thinking or free creating. And, and, and that does not ensure autonomy, but it ensures a space of exploration. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. We have a couple more minutes if there's any further. Thanks for your contributions. I really enjoy it, and they were quite complimentary. I totally agree with uh, Gary's uh, challenges. I think uh, he was totally uh, right uh, on what he was saying. But I want to, to, to just to comment your last uh, approach, saying that uh, ex the extrinsic value is the one that explains the, the cultural policy uh, budget and resources. But I think there is something which for me is very important is the synergies between intrinsic value and extrinsic value. And the positive synergies between both is what that give sense uh, to this particular uh, space of, culture, of public policy. And I think that's something which uh, maybe we could be develop. In, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, when I, to, I put it on the, uh, the edge and I say that there is no such thing as an intrinsic value with the arts. Uh, of course, I don't mean, I, then I try to um, see it from the perspective of being a, a politician who plays a role uh, in a and a democratic political system with its own rules, laws, uh, and its, uh, uh, its uh, traditions, uh, way of thinking, etc., etc. Um, uh, I don't say that uh, this is um, this is uh, relevant for anybody. Of course, I accept that people say that. Well, the arts has an in intrinsic value. For me, for instance, some uh, artists say, I don't, I don't care about the public. I'm, creati I'm creating my, my art for myself. Well, that's a subjective way of saying, um, telling what I think that I am. But of course, this, um, if you go deeper into it, uh, regardless of whether an artist care about the publics or not, there will be some other, there will be a recipient of the art. Otherwise it cannot be, it cannot be, be, be realized. So it depends on what perspective you see it from. And I just focused on, on the, the, um, the, trying to see it through the political system and the political rationality also about democratic political systems. <laughs>